Good afternoon and welcome to the UCL Lunch Hour Lectures. Gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Steve Miller is Professor of Science Communication and Planetary Science in the UCL Department of Science and Technology Studies. And he's also a member of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UCL. Professor Miller's Lunch Hour Lecture is entitled The Impact of Impacts how the media play in the death of the dinosaur debates. Thank you very much for coming and welcome Professor Miller. Thank you, Jakob. <clears throat> Thanks to all of you for coming out in this uh, horrible January. Oh, no, it's February now, isn't it? It's horrible <laughs> February uh, weather. I'm going to lower the lights on you a bit, so that means it's easier for you to take a nap if you want to. Um, and so, for those of you that uh, came in a bit earlier, sorry about repeating this. For those of you who didn't, three images up there. You're going to have a quick look at them now, and uh, you can write down what you think they are, and then at the end I'll tell you the answers, and you can see whether you got one, two, three, or zero right. There is no prize, I'm afraid. Right, so impact of impacts, um, and some emphasis on the role of the media. So one of the things that fascinated me for a long time was how we get from something like this to something like this. 65 million years ago, half the world's species disappeared, including the dinosaur. Some scientists believe that it was a comet which hit the Earth, causing a climatic change that resulted in the extinction of the dinosaur. So the first clip I showed you was from Walt Disney's 1940 Fantasia. If anybody has not seen Fantasia, you have not been educated. It's the best film that Walt Disney ever made. Very, very brave film when you consider the world conditions in 1939-40. And the very dramatic, challenging uh, interpretations that the artists made of the music that they were illustrating, including that clip from uh, their interpretation of the Rite of Spring, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. In fact, you see the dinosaurs kind of trudging off into a long, lonely, parched exit off the world stage, not really explained why. The second clip was from a 1994 edition of the very well-known children's, BBC children's programme, Blue Peter, in which Anthea Turner, the then producer, was setting the nation's 10, 11, 12-year-olds up for an event that was going to take place later in 1994. So, question, how do we get from this kind of lingering view of the death of the dinosaurs to the view that is expressed there, and probably if you went out onto Warren Street tube station and you said, what killed the dinosaurs? Everybody would say, oh, something smashed into the earth, insofar as they know anything about it or care anything ab about it. So, this paper, 1980, Alvarez, Alvarez, Asaro and Michael was absolutely key. And I'm just going to flag up the abstract. So the abstract is about the way in which a layer in the rocks between what is called the Cretaceous and the Tertiary period is rich with clay that is full of a substance called iridium that could not have come from the Earth, must have come from outside of the Earth, and lo and behold, it coincides with the point at which you have the mass extinction, the KT boundary, the KT mass extinctions. And that, for the team, is really significant as being something must have come in from outside to create this boundary layer, just at the point that all of these species were wiped out. What could that something be? They do the calculations and they work out it's roughly a, an asteroid 10 kilometers in diameter. And I've flagged up the three colors. This is just the, the abstract, and I've flagged it up in three colors because what you can see there 
is that the first part is about geology, the second part, uh, sorry, the, the, the uh, first part is about geology, the second part is about astronomy, astrophysics, the third part perhaps about paleontology, and this is a paper that crosses disciplinary boundaries. And one of the things that we know when scientists cross disciplinary boundaries is, firstly, they tend to use cross-disciplinary journals like Science and Nature, particularly if they've got big stories to tell. And secondly, that a lot of the scientific community only gets to hear about this through the mass media. Very often, say, geologists would certainly not read Astrophysical Journal or Icarus, which is the Journal of Planetary Science. They would be reading the proceedings of the Geological Society of America or something like that. You don't get in the normal course of things researchers in one field reading the journals in another field. Not in the normal course of things. This is not to say it never, it never happens. And so a lot of the scientific community were alerted to this new theory of the death of, death of the dinosaurs that didn't fit into any particular disciplinary niche thanks to articles like this by Walter Sullivan <coughs> in the uh, New York Times in which he explained about the theories for the, the, the time, more than uh, two, but he, he highlighted two theories for the death of the dinosaurs, one of them being the, uh, the asteroid impact. So this is within the scientific community who are still finding out about big scientific issues through the mass media. And there's been some studies done on the cold fusion debate that show very similar things happening when uh, Pons and Fleischmann claim to have uh, uh, discovered nuclear fusion in a test tube. Most scientists got to hear about it thanks to TV broadcasts. In fact, some scientists trying to work out if Pons and Fleischmann were right or wrong were taking photographs of their TV screens because that was the only way they could get their hands on the so-called peak, the neutron peak that was supposed to signify cold fusion taking place in a test tube. So what happens in the scientific community is that there is roughly a decade of discussion and debate as to whether or not this is the right theory or the wrong theory, and you can follow that in the pages of science and in the pages of nature and some of the other leading science journals. And then in 1991, the smoking gun is found. There is a huge crater in the Gulf of Mexico off the Yucatan Peninsula, Chicxulub off the Yucatan Peninsula, and it is roughly 180 kilometers in diameter, and that's the perfect size to fit a 20, uh, sorry, a 10 kilometer diameter asteroid impacting the Earth because, roughly speaking, you get an impact of so many kilometers across, and the crater it creates is 20 times as great as that. So 180, well it's 18 times a 10 kilometer impactor, which is what the Alvarez, Alvarez, Asaro and Michael team thought they had got. So 1991, it looks as if the debate in the scientific community is all wrapped up and over and that's great. So that's the scientific community. What about us ordinary mortals outside of the scientific community? How do we get to hear? How do we get to think that the death of the dinosaurs is due to some kind of an asteroid impact? I've done quite a bit of work looking at the mass media coverage of various things. And for me, the key event is in 1993-1994. In 1993, uh, Caroline Shoemaker, her husband Jean, and David Levy discover comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, which they originally described as a squashed comet spread out across the sky. <coughs> and 
it's orbiting not the Sun, as most comets do, but it's orbiting Jupiter. And when they do the calculations, it works out that actually this was a comet that got too close to Jupiter sometime in 1992. Jupiter's enormous gravitational field ripped it apart into 20 plus fragments. And if you calculate the orbits forward, it turns out that in July 1994, then these fragments are actually going to smash into Jupiter, which is jolly nice because astronomers around the world got a lot of warning that this event was going to happen and we could get ourselves ready to watch it. So what kind of thing did we see? By the way, this is a Hubble Space Telescope picture and you can see the individual fragments of the comet with the trains coming off them, and, you know, some of them bigger, some of them smaller. This is an image of Jupiter taken in the infrared. So it's looking at the heat coming out of the planets. It's not visible light. What can you see in this image? At the bottom left and the top right, these are the aurora of Jupiter. Hundreds of times more powerful than the aurora we have on Earth because Jupiter is such an enormous planet with an enormous magnetic field with an enormous amount of radiation trapped in that magnetic field that causes these aurora. Those of you with good eyesight can just about make out somewhere sort of uh, in the middle of the planet but a bit towards the south. That kind of splodge there is the great red spot. On the left-hand side of your image, you can see an impact site from Hawaii. The NASA Infrared Telescope facility is on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. We did not see the first impact, the first fragment impact, and you see the bright spot there is the scar left on Jupiter as a result of the first impact. But we did see the third coming through. We obviously saw the second and the third. And the third was really quite spectacular. These kind of images went viral. If you want to trace when ordinary people first really started to use the internet to find out about science, then it was Shoemaker Levy 9. The website or the, the uh, kind of the mail exploder used for Shoemaker Levy 9 got hundreds of thousands of hits in just a month. Nowadays, we talk about millions of hits in a day when NASA sort of lands a rover on Mars or something like that. But in 1994, pre-mass World Wide Web, Shoemaker Levy 9 was the thing that really brought science to the attention of millions of people, or hundreds of thousands of people anyway. So what is the role of the media in all of this? This is a cartoon from the time. Uh, I rather like that one. Um, I, think, I think it was The Guardian, but I, 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 won't, I won't swear to it. One of the great things about the media is that they are always on the lookout for good stories. And particularly in the summer months when the politicians are on holiday, they're really on the lookout for good stories. And particularly in this particular in this period, July the 16th to the 22nd, they were on the lookout for good stories because there weren't any politicians around and the World Cup, which was being held in the United States, had finished. So it was great timing. And they ran dozens and dozens of uh, stories in the run-up to and um, during the impacts. So, pre-impact. This is an article from The Guardian, Serial Killers from Heaven, that highlights the role of impacts centred around Jupiter. So this is um, just, uh, what's that, nine days before the first impact. And the one on the right, well, all kinds of crazies uh, got onto the bandwagon, and so this woman described herself as a plain clothes nun. <laughs> okay. Hope Putin's not got any of those around. Um, 
plain clothes nun, and this was a warning to the entire world that what was going to happen to Jupiter, Jupiter was going to explode, and uh, we should watch out, and Prince Charles and the Pope and so on had better take a lead in reforming everything. But what I will flag up to you is in the more serious Guardian, or more serious, the serious Guardian article, you can see that alongside their run-up to Shoemaker Levy 9, they are picking up on the Yucatan Peninsula, the end of the dinosaurs, etc. This is a news value that is known as co-option, where one story links into another to make the whole thing bigger, and you get a kind of a, um, a bandwagon effect. So this is co-opting the death of the dinosaurs, which had had a bit of coverage, but not a huge amount in the mass media, onto the stories that were building up around Shoemaker-Levy 9. After the um, events themselves, so we had a nice week of explosions, lots of TV coverage, live from the observatories, people in the studios and so on. Then another set of stories. I love this one about uh, pigeon fanciers blaming explosions on Jupiter for making their pigeons go off course. Um, but more seriously, it raised the issue that if we could see these major impacts and those ex the great red spot on Jupiter is bigger than the, uh, the Earth, so if you saw those explosions, they were bigger than the Earth. They were enormous explosions happening on Jupiter. Could this thing happen to the Earth? Could this thing happen here? So this was the kind of question that was being raised, and if it could, what on Earth could we do about it? And I had a look... Uh, at articles in a few of the leading papers, English language papers, about 25 of them uh, around the world. In this period in 1994, there's more than 80 articles on the death of the dinosaurs. Huge increase on what had been happening in previous years. And in particular, of that, those 80 plus articles, greater than 80% of them were linking in to this coverage of Shoemaker-Levy 9. So you see how popularisation of the impact theory of the death of the dinosaurs gets co-opted onto, gets carried along with the bandwagon of Shoemaker-Levy 9. In my view, that was a watershed in public perceptions around this issue of the death of the dinosaurs, but it flagged up, and it's become part of the rhetoric now, if the dinosaurs went, what about us? So what about the evidence we've got for impacts on Earth? Because it's all very well saying, oh, yeah, yeah, but this is Jupiter, and that's whatever it is, 750 million kilometres away from us, so why do we have to bother about that when you know, we're much more worried about things that happen in the next street or the next town or the next country? Here are some images. Something like 50,000 years ago, uh, 50 metre diameter, so really very small compared with what's thought to have wiped out the dinosaurs, smashed into uh, Arizona and created this one and a half kilometre wide crater. So this is something we know happened for sure, although originally there was a lot of dispute and it was Gene Shoemaker who demonstrated that this had to be a meteor crater and not an extinct volcano. 1908, um, a, something like a 30 metre lump of rock burnt up and exploded just over the Siberian uh, forest, uh, flattened something like a... Um, uh, a few thousand square kilometres of the forest. They say that the only casualty was a reindeer. I don't know how many, how many they quite know that, but anyway. Um, so these kind of things, we've got evidence of it happening. And if you make a map around the world of where you think there have been impacts in the past, and these are the relative sizes of the impacts, then the ones in red, we're absolutely certain are impact craters or the residue of impact craters. The ones in yellow, not quite so sure about. You can see uh, in the Gulf of Mexico the, the size of the impact that created the conditions for the extinction of the dinosaurs, etc. Um, 
But there have been others, you know, in South Africa that are, Southern Africa, of a similar-ish size. One of the problems we have, of course, of um, <coughs> looking for impact craters on Earth is that we have weather and they get worn away very quickly. So you're looking for traces in the geological record. So what kind of things might we be worried about? This is a family of uh, asteroids photographed by various space missions. This largest one in the middle is called Lutetia, and it's roughly 100 kilometers across. So that means it's got a thousand times the mass of the impactor that wiped out the dinosaurs. So if something Letitia's size came our way, all bets are off, no question about it. Others of them are much smaller, just a few kilometers across, but then remember those fragments that hit Jupiter were of the order of a few hundred meters to a kilometer across and the kind of explosions that they, they caused. <coughs> Letitia, by the way, was mapped by the uh, current European Space Agency Rosetta mission that I'll say a little bit more about in just a moment. So these are the kind of things we might be worried about. There was some excitement back in 2004 when we picked up on an asteroid called Apophis because initial calculations of the orbit said in 2029 it was going to get very close to the Earth and that in 2036 it might even be on collision course. And, you know, this is something like uh, 300 metres across, so it's not a dinosaur killer size of asteroid, but it's still, uh, it's still something that could cause some damage. And if we try to um, work out... <coughs> what kind of damage these things can cause, then you can sort of work out, well, if they hit the Earth, how big will the explosion be? These are not nuclear explosions because you've not got uh, nuclear material going off, but you've just got the sheer impact creating massive explosions as the atmosphere heats up, as the rock of Earth and the rock of the impactor are... Uh, uh, hit with supersonic shocks and simply f fragment and fly apart. Um, it's difficult to read this scale. So this is a, a scale here that goes up. So this number here is 10,000 megatons of TNT equivalent. And if you look at what Apophis would do, it's roughly in that region. So a 300 metre diameter impactor gives you something like 10,000, the equivalent of 10,000 megatons of TNT. So what people who work in this area have done is to put together a scale. So just as we have, or we used to have, the Richter scale for... Um, <coughs> for uh, uh, earthquakes and the Beaufort scale for wind speeds and so on and so forth. So we have a threat levels scale that's called the Torino scale for impactors. When it was originally detected, Apophis was roughly at scale four, close encounter with at least 1% chance of regional destruction. You can imagine letting off 10,000 megatons worth of TNT in a relatively local area. That's going to cause widespread uh, destruction. There have been new calculations, and at the moment, sorry about that, the, um, the current estimated threat level is much, much less than that. But I'm going to come back to Apophis in a minute just to sort of... Uh, raise the question of what might we do about it when. Ever since Shoemaker-Levy 9, 1994, people have started to take the issue of impactors causing destruction on Earth much, much more seriously. Indeed, 
David Levy, who is the co-discoverer of Shoemaker-Levy 9, talks about before we saw what happened to Jupiter, there having been a giggle factor, and nobody really took this issue seriously. And then his comment was, after Shoemaker-Levy 9, they laughed no more. And so there are various worldwide space guard type uh, activities. Um, this is the web page of the UK component of uh, space guards. The, I think it's just on the Wales Shropshire border, an observatory that spends all of its time looking out for things moving in the sky that hadn't been seen before, that didn't ought to be there, and that might represent some kind of impactor coming our way. So what kind of things do we know about these impactors? Well, the Americans in, um, on July the 4th, 2005, had a mission called Deep Impact, where they fired a block of copper the size of a washing machine at the nucleus of a comet to see how strong these things were. Were they just piles of um, <coughs> snowflakes, or did they have a solid icy core? What kind of density they had? I was involved at the Army um, shooting range in Aldershot using their high-velocity gas gun to see what kind of things you might expect if a projectile slammed into a cometary nucleus. One of these substances we tried right at the end was mashed potato to represent a kind of a fluff, fluffy uh, nucleus. Um, I'm glad we did it right at the end. The entire firing room was covered with mashed potatoes. <laughs> and the, uh, the, uh, the army uh, guy in charge of the, of, the, uh, of the gas gun range was not at all happy about the amount of work he would have to clear up. But if you fired it at a solid chunk of ice, you also saw, and we, particularly because we were using this camera that was taking under 1,000 or 10,000 frames a second, incredibly high-velocity camera, you could see the kind of things that uh, impactors would do. As I've said, ESA have their Ros Rosetta mission to uh, comments. Uh, churyumov gerasimenko it's a name all of you are expected to remember at the end of this lecture. <coughs> and they landed with limited success, a little lander called Philae on uh, November the 12th. Unfortunately, Philae bounced a few times. There's very little gravity on uh, something like a uh, cometary nucleus because they're fairly small. And where it is now, it's not getting much sunlight. So it's, it's dormant. And hopefully, the solar panels will kick in and it, we'll be able to get some uh, good results from the Philae lander to tell us about this particular cometary nucleus. <clears throat> what could we do about it? Right. This is the Earth going round the sun. And this might be an impactor coming in and smashing into the Earth. And you've noticed that I've targeted um, the west coast of the United States, one of my least favorite places. <coughs> no, I take it all back. I, I, one of our American students from STS is looking at me horrified. <laughs> right, so, but I've said that you've got a kind of a seven minute window. Why is that? Because the Earth moves on its orbit around the Sun, it moves about one Earth diameter in about seven minutes. Now, it's not quite a seven minute window because you've also got to take into account gravitational effects and so on and so forth. But suppose, if we go back, here comes the impactor. Suppose you could slow that impact up such that it arrived just a little bit later. Well, this is what you would hope would happen. So, or you could do it the other way around. You could speed it up so it arrived seven minutes earlier. But the idea is that if you could slow it up or speed it up, you could get it from a, an orbit where it was going to hit the Earth to an orbit where it would just go past the Earth. So this is why I call it the seven minute window. So these are the kinds of things that have been propo proposed. <clears throat> um, number one, whatever, were we to find that we had an impactor on course for Earth, whatever, you would have to have very extensive civil defense measures. 
Uh, I'm old enough to remember the old um, put a paper bag over the windows and get under the kitchen table advice you got in case uh, there was a nuclear war. Uh, don't think it would have worked, but anyway. <coughs> but, any, but so, warn and prepare. Okay. Then there are all sorts of possible ways of slowing down, speeding up. You could fly a spacecraft... Um, sorry about that. <coughs> you could fly a spacecraft <coughs> close to the object... You don't have to change the orbit very much to make a difference of seven minutes, you see. So, fly a spacecraft close by, pull it slightly off its orbit, hopefully you'll change the orbit in such a way that you don't hit the Earth, that it doesn't hit the Earth. Kinetic impact. Well, just like the Americans fired this block of copper into Comet uh, Temple 1 in the deep impact experiment, you could try smashing something into the body that was coming, the asteroid or comet that was coming in our direction, in order again to knock it slightly off course. You don't have to do too much. Or you could blast the thing off course. You're not going to blow it up, but what you're hoping for is that by uh, creating some kind of an explosion close to the surface of the asteroid or comet, you cause that uh, surface to get very hot, to vaporise, and you create a jet that pushes the uh, impactor slightly off course. So if we look at what we might do, here you've got a graph of the kind of warning time you've got in years, and the kind of measures that you could probably get moving with, depending on how much warning. So if we were concerned that Apophis was going to hit us on its current orbit, then we can use some kind of kinetic impactor. Go up there, fire something at it, knock it off course a little bit. What might happen with the POFIS in, um, uh, I think it's either in 2029 or 2030, is it's going to get another close encounter that might change its orbit slightly to make it what's called an Earth-crossing orbit. Then, if we didn't find out until 2029 that Apophis had been moved onto an Earth-crossing orbit, it's not on one at the moment, we would probably need some kind of nuclear explosion close to the, uh, <coughs> close to the asteroid to blast it away, to create that jet and blast it away. So, just to finalise... Um, some of you may remember that last year, September of last year, uh, there was an explosion just outside of Managua in Nicaragua. Um, that is reckoned to be a fragment of a rather nasty little asteroid called 2014 RC Pitbull, aptly named, not on a collision course with Earth though. And those of you with even longer memories might remember this particular event uh, just after Valentine's Day um, a, couple of <coughs> a couple of years ago. Uh, make a note of Chelyabinsk, um, February the 15th, 2013, if you want to see the videos. There are some very, very interesting videos. It is absolutely amazing to watch those videos. And the thing that most amazes me is that this guy is driving his car and there's this huge fireball streaking across the sky and he carries on driving straight towards it. I mean, I'd have slammed on the brakes and spun round the opposite way, but he's just kind of, oh yeah, listening to the radio, pop radio and so on. So I will leave you with a little bit of time for questions and, <coughs> excuse me, the following thought... Since we now know, or we think we know, what killed the dinosaurs, are we going to go the same way as they are, or are we going to seriously try to do something about it? Thank you very much. <coughs>
you sort of concluded the dinosaur bit with, with the, you know, it, it's settled. Um, yes. That it's, it's not. Uh, Ashto, but I was going to say, I've, I've oh, no, uh, no, since no, no, then, no. it's maybe got a bit less settled, and I've yes. heard, you know, yes. kind of, what, what, what's the, the current state and what we think about the dinosaur? Right, so the current state, I think, is that there is no doubt at all that something like 65, 66 million years ago, there was a major impact, um, and that created the, the crater at Chitzkaloub, um, and that does roughly fit with the period when the dinosaurs went extinct. But there is also major volcanic activity in India going on at the same time. I forget how many millions of square kilometres or, or cubic kilometres of lava are being extruded in what's a, called the Deccan Traps. And it's very likely that they also put... So the, the impactor is supposed to have wiped out the dinosaurs by putting so much dust, dirt, water up into the atmosphere that it creates what used to be known as a nuclear winter. The sun can't get through. Vegetation dies. Herbivores die. Carnivores die because nobody's got anything to eat. It could well be that volcanism is also responsible for putting a lot of those gases up into the atmosphere that cause climate changes that end up with the dinosaurs dying. It's a bit too much of a coincidence to have such a major impact right around the KT boundary. So there are arguments as to whether or not what happened was that the impactor came in and then that sent shockwaves around the world that triggered the Deccan Traps volcanism. That is still being hotly debated. Is there a mechanism by which that, can, that could happen? I gave a talk based on this at the Geological Society of America, <coughs> although I perhaps did a little bit more media analysis because they were more familiar with some of the geological theories. Um, and this old guy in a cap got up to ask a question and he said, oh, that was a very interesting talk, Professor Miller. Um, my name is Walter Alvarez. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> But he said, actually, I got the kind of the media uh, angle of it quite nicely right. And, but also sitting in the audience was a woman called Gerta Keller, who is a strong advocate of volcanism as being the extinction mechanism. And it was very nice that they both came up to me at the same time after the talk, and I was able to say, well, you know, if you want to create a new story now, you can have a go at one another about who's right and, and uh, who's wrong. So... It's settled and it isn't settled, is the answer. But again, I doubt very many... I, I will bet you ten times as many people in the general public think the dinosaurs were killed by some kind of impactor than think they were killed as a result of volcanoes going off in the Indian subcontinent. So you're right to point out that it's settled only insofar as it's not settled. <laughs> We have time for, for one more question, right up here, there's a microphone coming. Uh, hi, Professor Miller. Uh, you mentioned about using a nuclear device to yes. di divert an impactor. Would there be an impact on the Earth as a result of using a nuclear device? Um, only if it blew up before it got out of Earth orbit, frankly, because <coughs> once it's out in space, you know, I don't know how far away it might be from the Earth, but millions, tens of millions, even a hundred million kilometres away from the Earth, then even a nuclear explosion is not going to have any impact on Earth. The radiation dosage uh, goes down very rapidly as you, increase, as you increase the distance. So that is not likely to happen. It's just if you have an accident when you're trying to launch the thing that it could happen. So with the Cassini spacecraft, which is currently orbiting around Saturn, that's got a nuclear reactor in it. And in order to get it out as far as Saturn, which is ten times as far away from the Sun as we are, <coughs> they had to do what's called a gravity assist. Well, they did several gravity assists, and two of them were around the Earth. So you swing by close to the Earth, use the Earth's gravity to give the spacecraft a bit more energy, and that 
catapults it out into the outer regions of the solar system. And there were concerns that because Cassini had a nuclear reactor on board, if they got that wrong, it might actually cause a problem here on Earth. Fortunately, it didn't. Greenpeace didn't um, catch up with the first gravity swing by the Earth, but they were alerted to the second gravity swing by the Earth, and they made you know, some capital out of the potential dangers. But blowing something up, a nuclear bomb, something up tens of millions of kilometers away, no. Thank you. I hope you'll all be able to make it safely home after the lecture. <laughs> no major impacts. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Miller. Ah, the photo. Oh, gosh, thank you for reminding me. Right, okay. On the left there, um, oh, what's his name? Waterhouse. Um, these are life size models from the 1850s of the dinosaurs in Crystal Palace Park. Crystal Palace Park was the first Jurassic Park. Sorry, Steven Spielberg. Um, so that is meant to be Guanodon. It's beautiful, these statues. They need a lot of repair, unfortunately. Um, so that's, that's Crystal Palace Park. Clearly nobody here from South London apart from me. That is, in fact, Shoemaker Levy 9 exploding. That's a different image. And this is the Bayer Tapestry depicting Halley's Comet. So the Ist Mirant Stella. There's Halley's Comet up in the right-hand corner that William took as a good omen when it came round in March of 1066. Personally, I've always been against the Norman invasion, but I, it's a bit late to do anything about it. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs>